It's the Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams. This is the show where me gets to speak to pretty smart people who are doing great things in conservation. And today I'm talking to someone who has a pretty good public profile in Australia at least, and is pretty savvy in the way of getting his message across. It's also, let me note, someone with a really cool Twitter handle too. Those of you who are regular viewers or listeners will know that I love a good Twitter handle. It's Professor Hugh Possingham, who is the Chief Scientist for Queensland. Hi Hugh, thanks for joining me. Hugh, I I wonder whether it's something you've developed on purpose in your various roles, because you're also running a lab at the University of Queensland. But I don't know who the chief scientist is for any other jurisdiction in Australia, and I only know the chief medical officer of Victoria because he had a bit of a fan club and people were printing up custom-made bed sheets and and whatnot featuring his face early in the pandemic have you always been good at getting out there and being public and communicating the work you do i don't think i'm very good at it but i'm certainly not frightened of doing it and i see that as a role of a university academic in fact the role of any scientist if you do some science in the forest and you never communicate it or write it down did the science even happen so (laughs) it's our job i think to communicate isn't it and why programs like yours yours are so important i think you're tooting my trumpet a bit too much hugh i I wouldn't say that i would never attach important that's right Uh, we get on your good side can can i ask about the role of the chief scientist to government how does is that a new kind of thing actually I, i do remember that Professor Chubb was the chief scientist for Australia. And the reason I know that was in a former life, I was actually on the panel that interviewed him for the top job at VCAH, University of Melbourne. But I think his next post was the the chief scientist of Australia. So what's your role as chief scientist? And is it a new phenomenon? It's moderately new. Most states have a chief scientist and that the federal government's chief scientist is Cathy Foley, who was formerly at CSIRO. And you're right, Ian Chubb was a chief scientist. I think in this state, Premier Peter Beattie created the chief scientist role, and that was a, a guy called Professor Peter Andrews. And eventually after that was Jeff Garrett, who was a former head of CSIRO. Yeah, most states have them. Their positions are, can be variable from state to state in terms of how much influence and power and connectivity they have. It's becoming an increasingly popular thing. In Queensland, I get quite well-resourced in the sense I have 10 staff. I answer to the Premier and all the ministers, and I particularly answer to their science minister, to Megan Scanlon. But I also happen to be employed as a public servant. So in that sense, I would say, given a little bit of latitude above and beyond a typical senior public servant, but I still have to sign the Senior Public Service Riot Act or whatever they made me sign to say what I I love that. So whatever I had to sign, isn't that all of us where the terms and conditions run to 10 pages? We go, yep, okay, click. I I wonder, Hugh, let's talk a a little bit about Queensland without being too specific, (laughs) but recently there's been two issues which have garnered national attention. And of (laughs) course, the Great Barrier Reef is one, and then the expansion for in the what is the the Gala Basin isn't it and and I was particularly interested in the effect on the nominal little brown bird a, a finch but science has a should or should have an impact on policy making in all areas so apart from those sort of big ticket yeah. items how about general planning policy housing development yeah. road developments how much do ministers reach out to you as a chief scientist? It is a three-day-a-week job, and there's about 20 ministers. It's challenging. Some of them have less to do with science than others, but most of them have something to do with science, which is good. Those, the big-ticket item, Dani Mine, was, was more or less done and dusted before I started, which was a year and a half ago. On the planning side, actually, I have our ministers very interested in that. The Deputy Premier, Stephen Miles, is very interested in and I suppose there's two or three 
hottish issues around planning. One is just the number of people moving into Queensland, particularly South East Queensland. The, the statistics are really, well, the data's alarming. 100,000 people are arriving every year, 100,000 people. So the pressure on the system in terms of basically providing housing and infrastructure for those people is enormous. So Brisbane is growing rapidly. In fact, if it keeps going like this, I think we, we get to pass Melbourne sometime 2060. I'm not sure whether that will happen. So there's a lot of biodiversity in the southeast of Queensland and all along the coast. So it's not just Brisbane, but it's other rural centres. Koalas are a flashpoint for that, particularly. You were just seeing recently the federal government promising several hundred million dollars for koalas. Koalas just got uplisted to endangered for both New South Wales and Queensland. And in this state, many people down south may not know, elections have been won and lost on koala policy. So actually I am working very closely at the moment with the state government at multiple levels trying to improve the planning process. My one liner on that is you can argue all you like about the finite nature of resources on the planet, whether they're fossil fuels or lithium or soil. But one thing I do know is the surface area of the planet is fixed. Therefore, what you decide to do with every hectare of soil, I think is really important. For example, just ignoring biodiversity and birds for a while, 4.2% of Queensland is called high-value agricultural land. That is the land which can produce, deal with intensive cropping and produce a lot of food in a small area. And we've sometimes put um, solar panels on that. We've often put houses on top of that. And and that's very frustrating, I think, from a planning perspective, let alone doing the same thing on the last known habitat of threatened species or where there's important koala habitat. So we're really working hard, I hope, to come up with better integrated planning solutions that more logically decide what is the best use for a, for a piece of dirt. And you, I think many people in Australia have always thought, oh, this is huge, this is a continent, it's the size of Europe, it's the size of the continental United States, why do we have to worry about planning? The, the bits that are very useful for things like agriculture and people to live in uh, and a lot of biodiversity are actually quite restricted and there is intense competition over that land. Apart from working at, at the Queensland Government, You've also had a role at the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. So what I'm always interested in, probably bore the pants off off people with this, but that intersection between policy development, the advice that ministers receive, the bodies that are set up to deliver that advice, they all give great opportunities for announcements and beautiful websites with pictures of furry animals and people with bush hats and whatnot doing things. But how often is your advice taken on board and acted on? And in fact, for a minister that seeks your advice, and I think those two, obviously the state body is, or the state position is a bit different, but the Threatened Species Recovery Hub was set up to to drive policy and determine what research was needed for threatened species. Is there any, what's what's the word I'm looking for, like um, obligation for a minister to act on the advice, to follow your advice? Uh, No, not at all. We're providing science advice, and then I think they would then say, and science, I use the word science in the broadest possible sense. It can be economic advice, it can be social science advice, not just ecology and stuff, more traditional sciences. And, of course, now science includes the knowledge of, of First Nations people. So all that knowledge needs to be brought to bear on decision-making. I think they always listen to the advice. I think they're beholden. But as scientists, we aren't really telling them what to do. I think the best advice is this is the facts of the situation. This is the evidence. These are the causal chains between actions we take and events like declines in threatened species. And we can provide opportunities, but, of course, we're not doing everything. We're not looking at the objectives of local communities. We're not in a position to integrate all the things that a politician has to integrate. And so, in a sense, we're there to give them tools and options. So let me pick a particular circumstance, which was extremely contentious when I was asked, and this is 1997, to look at the problem of overpopulations of koalas on Kangaroo Island. And at that point, a guy had put some koalas on Kangaroo Island in the 1920s the professor of zoology, actually, because he was concerned that koalas were going extinct on the mainland, so incredibly prescient from for 100 years ago. 
and he put them down in Kangwon because he, he saw Noah's Ark. This was a professor of zoology at Adelaide University. He saw uh, Kangwon like a Noah's Ark. So, in fact, they put some brush turkeys there, which wasn't possibly so prescient because they're doing quite well. Koalas, platypuses and stuff like that. Gangangs, believe it or not. The koalas ended up being having 20,000 of them and staying eating themselves out of house and home and killing the trees that they were feeding on. And this has happened in Victoria routinely, as you would know. Koalas have been put onto islands and they've become overpopulated and sometimes they've all just died. So um, we ran that committee. So we gave the minister a lot of options and we went through uh, a structured decision-making process, which is what I built a lot of my career on using multi-criteria decision analysis and cost effectiveness to say, here are your management options for koalas on Kangaroo Island. Here are some objectives that you want to achieve. For example, you want to do whatever you do, minimising stress to koalas. So there's animal welfare objectives. There's environmental objectives. We don't want the ecosystem to collapse. There, there are social objectives that we probably, even though they're an introduced species, we might want some koalas still to persist from a tourist perspective. So you line it all up and then you give them that advice. Uh, uh, of course, you're bringing science to bear on the consequences of actions for outcomes, uh, which is called a model, really, or a theory of change. And in the end, the politician has to weigh up the outcomes, I think, uh, cost effectiveness, outrage and all these other things. In the end, we did actually recommend some culling of koalas that on the international outrage scale, that was too far for the minister to go. So in the end, they did a lot of translocations and they did a lot of sterilisations. So I feel so we did our job in giving the minister all the pros and cons of various options, but in the end, the politician makes the decision. I'm pretty sure when you uh, put that particular option in the brief to the, to the minister that you already knew that would have been a non-starter, but as you say, you have to present it. Yeah. Hugh... How good do you think the scientific literacy, for want of a a, a term, is amongst the politicians and senior bureaucrats that you must rub shoulders with? Yeah. In general, I'm very impressed. The ministers I've met here in Queensland over the last year and a half are smart, they're dedicated, they listen. They're very time poor, I have to say. Their ability to dig into the details is low, but they're interested in evidence. They're interested in doing the best they can for the community. So science literate, I think they assemble data. And let's maybe go to the senior bureaucrats who are also helping them make decisions and provide policy advice. One of them said, Hugh, no single paper will ever drive policy. They almost, let's talk about the Great Barrier Reef, they look at the weight of evidence. And particularly in the state government, I have to say, quite a few scientists working to analyse and synthesise information and bring policy advice to bear to the politicians to make decisions. Where the chief scientist often gets called in is, for example, we've just been working on the management of crocodiles in Queensland. So we, at an independent committee, review the way the department was managing crocodiles now and into the future. And that report, I think, will soon be released. So in that sense, the, the chief scientist, I think, has a capacity to provide a group of people, independent experts, to look at a particular problem and and give that left-field advice, particularly when it's a a very contentious. Do you think that the literacy in science, environmentalism, conservation imperatives is increasing amongst the the community that also influence the decisions Mm. that politicians make? And I guess I'm always referring to where the money resides and is able to speak, and that's really in in terms of development, particularly particularly for housing. I think let's broadly just speak about the general public. Does the general public know that we are in an extinction crisis? I would say probably not as much as you or I would hope. So I live in a suburban street in Brisbane, and we have street parties and Christmas parties, and it doesn't often happen. They know I'm the chief scientist. Sometimes they think that means I'm just involved in education. They don't realise I'm connecting through to policy and decision-making because they think of science as something you do at school. So there's always these misconceptions about what even science is. Not often, it's not common for people to say to me, is biodiversity really in trouble? I go down to the park here in Leafy Sherwood in southwest Brisbane and I see a lot of birds. And I see water dragons and I can see koalas still in some parts of Brisbane, but aren't things okay? It looks as though there's a lot of life out there. And I do then refer to them to 
things like the Threatened Species Index, which we created from that Threatened Species Recovery Hub that you mentioned. When I formed that, one of our first tasks was to say, there's no point having uh, to spend $30 million on research on threatened species if we don't actually have some fundamental tracking of how threatened species are going across the nation. So part of our job, one of the many projects we did, probably 1% of our money was spent on getting an index for the state of Australia's threatened from birds, mammals and plants. And that's been very influential. So I was surprised when we went to talk to Graham Samuels, who reviewed the EPBC Act most recently, not that anything's happened from that review. We re- he reviewed the Act and one of the first questions he was when it's like my neighbours, and these are all highly educated, intelligent people who are well connected to the media. Is there really a problem here? Extinctions happen, but there's always extinctions. And we say, to be honest, the extinction rate in Australia is probably a thousand times the normal background rate. And then we had assembled this data and we could show Graham Samuels, and I can show my neighbours, showing that the abundance of threatened birds in Australia has dropped by about 60 or 70% over the last 20 or 30 years. And that's quite dramatic. We would basically lose bird abundance across the board at a roughly 1% or 2% a year. And for the threatened birds, it's probably more like 2%. And for the, for the common bush birds, it's probably more like 1%. Of course, some birds, as you know, are going up and some birds are going down. But on average, there is an enormous decline of abundance and we're pushing more and more species towards extinction. And the data is unequivocal and, it's, and it is dramatic. Imagine if your superannuation went down 1% every year. If you were, all your investments disappeared at 1% or 2% every year, you'd be quite cranky. Or your expected lifespan was disappearing at 1% or 2% every year, you'd be also quite cranky. That's one of the reasons, Hugh, why I get so ranty sometimes because I think we, we've identified the problems. But at, if there was, a, a, as you said, a negative, a negative increase, a decline in anything that was financial or economic, uh, there would yeah. be outrage. Here, yeah. Just take you back a little bit down memory lane. The Threatened Species Recovery Hub that you mentioned, and obviously you were part of the development of that, is that something that government drove the process of the formation mm. or did it come from mm. people outside like yourself, Here, you? Well, Greg Hunt played a big role in that and he really wanted, he called for applications for a Threatened Species Recovery Hub. So literally that was his personal passion. And as Environment Minister and some of the Environment Ministers beforehand, like Senator Robert Hill, who created the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, sorry, there are politicians who have a passion for conservation and we can't have a passion for threatened species and that's why he wanted us to put in a bid for that research hub, which we did. And he actually came to us and asked us to look into that possibility. So, yeah, he w- that was great. It was great to have the support. And one, when we win, won through the competitive process, it was great to have the support of the minister because that's what they wanted to do. And the process of what research we did was a co-development process along with the federal government department. That, w- that said, I would say we all love co-development. We all like, believe or co-design in terms of research programs. It is interesting having ran three national environmental research centres in a row from about 2006 all the way until I went to the Nature Conservancy in 2016. So this is three major national centres. Exactly what the federal government wanted, we paid a lot of attention to and we did some things they wanted. Some of the things we did, they didn't want. In fact, sometimes they didn't like it. In fact, they tried to stop us making a threatened species index. Oddly, they <laughs> stop us at various times working on biodiversity offsetting. It's, it's very popular in universities to now say you should go to your end user and co-design research programs. I can tell you more stories, half a dozen stories, of where we did, we've always gone through a co-design process, but we actually then, with the autonomy we have from getting a big grant, chose to do things they didn't like or they didn't want. And then within two to five years, they suddenly want it. So you know, a lot of people in the public service and ministers and policy people, they know what they want for the next year or two. I don't think they often know what they want in five or ten years' time. And that's, I think, the beauty of having applied researchers in universities who can look over the hill and say, actually, you really do need a good offsets calculator. And we think we'll need, you'll need it in four or five years' time. They tried to stop us and we just kept working on it. And lo and behold, the work that Martine Marin Megan Evans and I and others did on the offset calculator, now is embedded in the EPBC Act. That work, which when they wanted it in six months' time, we'd been working on for five years. That's maybe an answer that 
makes me a little bit embarrassed here because I've been really critical of the succession of environment ministers that we've had in the country, but perhaps perhaps my list of worst five environment ministers, which I think have been in succession, perhaps I need to excise Greg from from that list. I grew up very close to where Greg Hunt grew up and and there's not a good track record down down there with the family. So I've I've always had obviously a bias in that. But um, yeah, they're, they're heavily constrained. When you get into cabinet and cabinet's confidential, they're one minister amongst many, and they I think they can often have their heart in the right place. But it, it's a bung fight. And let's be very frank about where Australia's prosperity has gone in the last twenty or thirty years. We are a filthy rich country, and all the people might say where's the money the money's all gone to it, 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 the health the cost of keep keeping australians alive living healthier longer lives and the fact we're an aging population that is the health budget keeps going up and up and you can track it through time the environment budget most other budgets agriculture departments they're all going downhill uh, bit by bit and it's health where all our money is and i think most people I care very little to certain extent about health, but most people, their primary concern is the health of them and their family, and that's why the money goes there. I think, Hugh, it, it's a really complex thing that if you look at it just the way you presented it then, is that's the biggest part of the spending of the government. But I, I would also put forward that a huge proportion of our wealth in the last 20 years has gone to people who are already quite wealthy in, in various mechanisms that the government uses to actually not collect money. So that if you look at one side of, of the ledger, it's all about health. If you look yeah. at it in the other side of the lecture, it's all about houses. It's getting richer, and we see that. All the measures of inequity in Australia are getting worse, and that's very disappointing. And we continue to cut tax. So one of my a few letters I've ever written to the newspaper was about 15 years ago was to the Australian, they actually published it, was three sentences, and it said, I would like to pay more tax. I lost 99% of the readers then. The second sentence was, I lost everybody with the second sentence. I trust the Australian government to spend my tax dollars wisely. You probably didn't need the words after, I trust the Australian government, because by then everyone was laughing. (laughs) And then I value the goods and services they provide, which is health, environment, and, and so forth. So bottom line is, I think the biggest, to exactly your point, we have had, it doesn't really matter which political party you you care about, but for the last 20 or 30 years, we've been reducing the size of government, we've been reducing the size of public services, and we're trying to get the tax rate lower and lower because we've bought into the Reagan-Thatcher trickle-down model. The Reagan-Thatcher trickle-down model doesn't work, and, and we know that, and the inequities we're creating are bad for people, but they're also very bad for the environment. And I hate to say that. So I think I don't blame the individual environment ministers across Australia. I think generally want to do the best thing they can do, but the resources they have to hand are, are very limited. The power they have to hand is small. And, and, and in some senses, the role of government in being the primary, organi- primary agency to save Australia's species continues to go down. And so in the end, it's you and me, Grant. You, me, BirdLife Australia, Bush Heritage Australia, Australian Wildlife Conservancy, Queensland Trust for Nature. We've got to do it now because nobody else will. And, Hugh, I want to draw into that list. It's Mm. actually every person who listens to what we're saying, who sees the the segment on the the 7.30 report or or the news or whatever about platypuses, echidnas, wombats, helmeted honeyeaters, orange-bellied parrots. It's actually... While the organisations and the institutions that are banded together are important, there's far more sway in in 5,000 individuals to write a letter and say, hey, we're watching you, bozo, because apparently a letter is 20 times more significant than an email because it takes so much more effort to do. Hey, and an email is 10 times more important than voting. So I always say when I end my talks, what can I do? I say write a letter or well, go and have a meeting with your local member, federal, state, local government, doesn't matter who it is, and just say, I care about biodiversity, I care about birds. That single act is more powerful than you voting for your entire life. Yeah, the only qualification I'd put on that is that if you are able to move 
with 12 months out from an election to a very marginal seat. Do that and vote, but nobody can do that. But where, where I live, my vote doesn't matter a, a bit because I'm in an extremely seat. But going to a meeting on the other side of town where a minister or a junior cabinet, cabinet minister is and tapping them on the shoulder and saying, hey, yeah. one, that's something they're going to remember. Also, I think calling electorate officers and being polite has some impact. Don't be yeah. ranty and shouty like me. No, I think um, being polite, I think the best approach for meeting anybody who's a politician is to first acknowledge something that they've done. You're going to see a, a, a member of parliament go and look at their maiden speech, which is all recorded. Just listen to it and then say, oh, I enjoyed this bit of your maiden speech. Hopefully there's one bit of their maiden speech you enjoy. And then just because you've got to acknowledge that they are a person who politicians I consider generally work very hard. I don't think the salary they get is particularly fabulous. So acknowledge what they do, acknowledge that they're there for the benefit of the public and then start talking about what you care about. And even if you are in a safe seat, to be honest, I think, they just need to know that the number of people who care about nature continues to go up in this country. It's getting bigger and bigger. And in fact, companies and industry and the public are starting to drive the agenda. And, and, and government, to be honest, because their resources are so low, because they keep cutting the tax base, maybe it's us and industry who are going to start driving the agenda. Is it the big, is it the big companies? When I was working for the Nature Conservancy, we had Amazon, we had Microsoft, we had the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. We, had, we were in conversations with all of them about biodiversity conservation, and they are all determined not just to be net carbon positive, by 2030 or 2040, well before any government, they want to be net biodiversity positive now. I, I don't know if you want to comment on this, Hugh, but that's one of the big problems I see in this policy area is that governments are actually outsourcing decisions that should be being taken by, by an informed public service advising a minister who is responsible to the people foundations and, and whatnot, even though they're, I'm not trying to be disparaging about this, but I don't actually want them driving the policy agenda. I want them inter influencing it, but I don't want them driving it. And I certainly don't want them to be the primary funding source to protect national assets. But I think we've made it very easy for that to occur. <laughs> Who's that? Somebody's delivering something. I'll just be one. Second. No worries, mate. I'll, I'll I'll keep I'll keep rambling. If if anybody's got something they'd like to perhaps put in, you can always ask me on Twitter at Bird Emergency, and there's Hugh's fantastic Twitter handle on the screen too at Huge Possum. We're always good at hearing those kind of inputs. Yeah, I, I wonder that was your. Your South Korean BBC moment. <laughs> Remember that when the toddler came in on the live yeah. interview? That was, that was really... I wonder if, you, if you've got a thought about that, about how I'm not sure there's a plan for governments to outsource the responsibility and the funding, but that it's quite convenient and it's just happening bit by bit. Have you got a view on that? It is happening bit by bit, and there's no doubt about it. Legislation and regulations do a certain amount, and, and, and may I, you and I would probably hope they would do a bit more. So that's the role of government. Even going back to uh, Senator Robert Hill, and he created that Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. He had us look at market-based instruments for, for conserving nature. He created the NHT and the Natural Resource Management Bodies. And many of those activities were to try and get the business of biodiversity, the business of nature conservation, to be more a business, which generated a flow of some income, and to try and wean that activity out of the hands of government. And I'm not particularly a fan of that, but that's what's been happening for the last 20 years. They're hoping that philanthropy will step in, they're hoping that industry will step in, and they're hoping that you and I will step up, and we do. They said every time we step up, then their responsibilities are less. So if we're, if we're doing all the work ourselves, we could argue philosophically about the pros and cons of that. To be honest, Grant, it's just happening. It's yeah, just, that, that, and, and, I, and I sit there and I've seen it happening for 30 years, so I just say, I'll I would, I'm living with that. I'm going to work within the constraints I've got because I yeah. can't change global politics. Yeah, well, it, 
my problem with with it, Hugh, and I I appreciate it if you don't want to comment on this, but in a, in an Australian sense, my problem with it is if you're relying on foundations, if they're not the large private vanity foundations, then what you've got is that it's a handful of people who are generally from fairly similar backgrounds and, shall we say, social status or whatnot, then making the decisions. And they're responsible to nobody. But I certainly don't want Andrew Forrest to, and his foundation to be a major funder of conservation because in a lot of cases, his personal and professional interests in in some cases won't align at all with with some of the conservation imperatives so if we're allowing our public policy to drift in that way simply because it means taxes don't have to go up and i I, actually i'm cynical enough to think that's exactly what it is if there's going to be a giveaway they'd rather to get they'd rather give it to people who are buying uh, struggling to buy a house than to give it to somebody who's got to drive 15,000 k's a year doing a survey for an unknown species of I mean, do, do you have a do you have a view on that is it dangerous yeah. I think it's dangerous and and potentially very damaging for what we're trying to achieve I have a, and it's a good question so I would say I sit on the fence in a sense the experiments already happened it has happened in the United States so the organization I worked for as chief scientist in the United States was the Nature Conservancy. In terms of finances, it's the biggest environmental NGO in the world. It's bigger than WWF at a global scale, or roughly the same size. And most of it is funded through philanthropy. So we're talking about large donors by people who, again, are quite privileged and they've amassed a lot of wealth, and their primary concern is climate change and biodiversity and ecosystem services, and also other sustainable development goals like equity and looking after people. So that's happened. The Nature Conservancy over 70 years has managed to, in some way, protect, conserve, secure a very large fraction of the United States and often given it to national parks. Sometimes they manage it themselves. Sometimes they put it under easements. So, for example, those of you who have been to San Francisco is on the south side of the Golden Gate Bridge, cross the Golden Gate Bridge, and you see why isn't those beautiful grasslands and woodlands, why aren't they all houses? Some of the most high-value housing land in the world is because conservation groups like the Nature Conservancy have protected that land. So we already have a model, whether you like it or not, US conservation is largely driven by the private sector more so than the public sector. And they're a very strange and different country for anything else in the rest of the planet. They have as much biodiversity as us, but they have an economy that's 20 or 30 times bigger and they have recovered threatened species. They've recovered 30 or 40 or 50 threatened species over a period of time when Australia's recovered almost nothing. So that said, they have a huge... Yeah, the, the problem with, or one of the problems with that model is that the sort of popular, the icon species then get the attention and, and attract mm-hmm. the funding and perhaps mm-hmm. even, I, I don't know, but perhaps even they're the species that people then want to do the research on because they are familiar with them, and that's probably a sub a subconscious bias. Yeah, do you, is it stra- but, but it's not. I don't think it's any worse than where we are at the moment. The federal government just handed five hundred million dollars to koalas. The U.S. Endangered Species Act has stopped di- dams for snails. One of the most powerful <laughs> threatened species in the United States is the gopher, which is quite cute, but it's not a koala and it's not a moose and it's not a wolf. No. So I think, and the Nature Conservancy's the primary activity was building a representative protected area system based on ecosystems. So it was pretty well threatened species neutral, based on the fundamental principles of conservation science. I was the chief scientist, but we had 450 scientists driving that agenda. Many ways more scientists than a government would have, and we work closely with universities. So I'm not sure, yeah, I understand your lament. We do often spend too much money on iconic species is that I think governments fall into that trap just as much as big corporations and private individuals. Actually, that's interesting language there, Hugh, because I, I don't for a second lament any of the money that is spent on those iconic species. I lament that an equivalent amount of money isn't being found to be spent on the non-iconic species. It's that, it's that issue where 
it's easy for a minister to announce something to save something that everybody's heard about. But people aren't heading out to a press conference about, I don't know, the eastern bristlebird. And so, I, 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 look, it's, it, it, it's not a point of contention, I think, as you said. It's here. We just have to deal with it and find a way perhaps to make the levels of funding and the awareness in the public sphere where the pressure builds to apply to more species. Yeah, and I, I see my theory of change in this space is I think bird watching, say, is growing enormously. Regularly survey Oxley Creek Common, which is a bit of degraded land in the middle of the suburbs, of, and I've got 350 e-bird lists there, and I have been counting there systematically every month for since 2004. But I also count bird watchers. And when I first went there in 2004, on average, I would see half a bird watcher, which wasn't a very short bird watcher, one <laughs> bird watcher every second. Every visit. two visits. Yeah. Right. Now, like last survey, I'm there for 140 minutes on my bicycle. I think I had 12. And interestingly, seven had cameras and five had binoculars. So bird watching is booming. Natural history is booming. And you would have seen it through your show, but the number, of, a lot of it's to do for photography, a lot of it's to do with uh, smartphones and apps, uh, the availability of information, the ease of which you can get calls, and also eBird and bird data, being able to see all this data. Uh, so to me, that's the core of the conservation movement. And, and, and it's much bigger in Europe and North America. And as that rapidly builds, I think the pressure will be on for things like the eastern bristlebird, a small brown bird that's really hard to see and nobody expects to see because they're hard to find. Certainly the northern subspecies is almost impossible to find. I have seen the, the southern one consistently down at Jarvis Bay, but I think the pressure is going to build. So I'm very optimistic because I feel natural history. Some aspects of conservation ebb and wane, even things I suspect like climate change, but natural history people remain conservationists for their whole entire life. Hugh, audio stuff's really important, and I just want to totally bring something unrelated in. Is that a blue budgie or a green budgie? <laughs> I could hear one in in oh. the background, or is that or is that outside birds no, hanging it, around? It could be. I thought it was. No, there's no budgies nearby. I haven't got a caged bird. Oh, yeah, yeah, good question. Oh, maybe it was just Laura Keats chattering to I each other. It might have been it, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. There we go. Totally threw it off track, but I, I thought, oh, you've got a, you've got a couple of budgies in the kitchen. Hugh, can I go back to something you talked about earlier? Offsets. Now, off, sort of a big, sometimes a dirty word. I'm, I'm always making light of them. How are, are we using offsets? Do you think are we using them better, or are they, as I sometimes think, a convenient way for? A, for a developer or any proponent of yeah. development to give a politician an easy way to say yes. Yeah. And without going, I hate these words, ideally when a development is progressing, whether it's a coal mine or a road or a housing development, we should go through the mitigation hierarchy, which is a terrible phrase. But we should avoid and we should mitigate. And the last, so we should basically, if we're threatening something like mudflats where eastern curlews are or habitat for eastern grizzlebirds, anything that's listed, or migratory and so forth, or rare and threatened ecosystems, we should really be trying to say no. And, and in fact, our advice to the um, Samuels Review of the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act and my continued advice to Australian governments is we need more places that just say you can't do anything there and you can't, you should just not even consider developing in that location. It might be three, five percent of the country with a last known population of threatened. But unfortunately, you're right, because we don't have that red map of this is a no-go zone. And they do will try and avoid. And, and of course, different states are different with respect to their legislation. The federal government's different to the states. But eventually, it can be sometimes a bit too easy for them to say, well, we do have to knock down this five hectares of casuarinas. And oh, yes, I realise that glossy black cockatoos live in that five hectares, but I can't see any way around it. So we'll try and restore some habitat somewhere else. It used to be just protect habitat somewhere else. Now you actually have to ideally restore habitat somewhere else. That said, of course, as well as I 
you plant a casuarina seedling, it's not going to be useful to a glossy black cockatoo for 30, 50 years. And certainly if you're losing hollows, it might be 100. So that's the bad downside of offsetting. Ideally, it makes it much more difficult for them to destroy habitat. Ideally, we do end up in 50 to 100 years' time with more habitat, but there are plenty of examples of it not working very well. My I, I, offsetting, I think, is getting better. And I have worked with many state governments to improve it. Is it perfect? It's far from perfect. I just think it's better that we have some offsetting because if we had none, we'd get nothing. Yeah, that that's obvious, isn't it, that if we didn't have any, we'd have none. But I wonder, Hugh, in the time that it's been commonplace that mm. awarding permission to do something, be it, as you said, a port, a development, new factories on the outskirts of the suburbs that then rapidly become the centre of, of a new suburban zone. Are we getting better at utilising offsets? Because my fear is that in 15 years' time, we'll have all of these offsets that have been planted with whatever has been mm available and perhaps poorly maintained but they're not contiguous so if you've got these zones or parcels of of land that are supposed to be wildlife reserves and they're not contiguous it in a way they're a problem area that become costly to maintain so are we learning are we getting better so the work we're doing here in queensland and some of the work Martine Marin, who is here at University of Queensland, is one of the world's leading experts on offsets and also of Australia's president. We are actually, try- and my background is in spatial planning and protected area design. We're really trying to bring offsets and protected area design together so that we do create more spatially cohesive offsets that where you get the bigger bang for your buck because they're part of corridors, they're targeting threatened ecosystems, they're well connected to existing habitat. So that's where the planning and the offsetting should really happen. So we have a vision, and it, we tried to do some of this in Western Melbourne, Cumberland Plains, Port Peel in Perth, so various cities, whereby the offset should ideally be even better located than the habitat that was destroyed. If you're destroying some isolated habitat, you would be restoring habitat and, and improving habitat that was in a better location from a spatial perspective and similar habitat for similar threatened species. So then you're actually ideally doing the zoning that local governments do at the same time as looking for sites that are future offset sites that will be uh, part of corridors and part of larger protected area systems. So that I'm not going to say that's perfect, but these are the conversations we routinely have in these regional expansion areas. Yeah, that's really encouraging because in a perfect world, if you were wanting to resume really high value habit for development in one area the offset would have to be the equivalent or better habitat my my concern having worked for companies that that are providing services to new developments and whatnot and involved in some of the planning is that the maintenance budgets wholly in insignificant if a development is a three-year, maybe five-year, maybe seven- or ten-year development, that's how long the maintenance is planned for. And then after that, it goes back to the public purse, which means to do it means you have to cut back somewhere else, and that just doesn't happen. It just goes unnoticed. The time frames are problematic. And one of the best papers I think we wrote, and this was led by Sarah Beckersy at RMIT, and I think my sole contribution to this was come up with the title of the paper where I, I suggested that biodiversity, the biodiversity bank should be a savings bank, not a lending bank. So at the moment, to your point, we take from nature, we take five hectares of, of beautiful grassland or grassy woodland, we destroy it, and then we promise to pay back. And of course, that payback time is 30, 50, in some cases with old growth forests with large hollows, it might be 200 years. And, and who's going to guarantee we pay that back? Because not many institutions last 200 years. So my hope is that, and we're talking, call, call them advanced offsets in Queensland, is that there'll become a premium through legislation and processes whereby if you decided to start to buy some degraded, say, dairy land and start restoring it into rainforest or grassland or grassy woodland, then you could sell your offset at a premium in the future because it already exists and you could show them, hey, look, 
I've spent seven years making this grassland. Look at this grassy woodland. The trees are already eight metres high. Um, I'm on the way and it's well managed. So we're actually doing advanced offsetting and that would not completely stop stop the problems you're talking about but would give me more comfort that something was going to happen. That, that raises, a, I knew this would happen here, that we'd, we'd end up having a conversation that ranged off in all sorts of areas and we wouldn't get to the thing you, you really want to talk to, but we will get to that in a minute. But just mentioning sort of the value of trees of a certain age and we're not consistent with that because if we can value horticultural specimens, I'm thinking of in Melbourne, we have these fantastic lemon-scented gums in Kew and Camberwell that are, are maybe 70 years old, so they're, you, can, you can't quite cuddle them. But if they're valued as an urban horticultural specimen, they have astronomical values. But if it's part of really important habitat in, I don't know, let's pick, pick a location, Mullaney or something like that, uh, uh, 150 kilometres from an urban centre, those sticks of timber have yeah. almost no value from a financial point of view. Are we moving towards something where we can really value thing, individual yeah. stands or even individual trees or blocks yeah. of remnant vegetation in a way that a landholder can really use to increase yeah. their wealth? I hope so. And, and and I hope that this process, really what you're talking about is paying landowners for ecosystem services where the primary ecosystem service might not just be about soil and carbon. The carbon market's already working. There isn't really a soil market per se. There are, is water trading, so people restoring riparian areas, they can be rewarded for improving the quality and quantity of water and reducing flash so all those things can happen. Can we get the biodiversity market to pay for that? I'm very optimistic, and I'm optimistic because of what I said before about many big companies and big organisations saying they won't just be carbon neutral by 2030, but they'll be biodiversity neutral or biodiversity positive by 2030. So they'll be looking to protect and restore those incredibly valuable assets that you're talking about, not turn them into money, but turn them into metrics of biodiversity performance. So we have things like habitat hectares. We can start to assess the contribution of, of scattered uh, large old trees to woodland birds. So once we can start to quantify those benefits and, again, not turn them into money, then they start to be tradable items and people want to have ledgers. Western or BHP might or Chevron might want to be able to prove, hey, look, we have done some damage here and there but we've done these investments for nature over here, our net impact on biodiversity is positive. And I think in five years' time, many companies want, will want to be have, have auditable books. So to your point of old trees, my favourite birdwatching part of the world is still the southeast of South Australia, west of the Wimmera from a Victorian perspective. And that area is really has very little vegetation left. The remnants are well protected, so there's no large-scale land clearing going on. But we have these huge eucalyptus river red gums, blue gums, manna gums scattered out in paddocks and they're all slowly dying. Can we protect them? Can we get those farmers? Can we pay them to maintain those open grassy woodland systems and they will have some productivity in them? And can we get that going and can we make it financially profitable from them? Because I just don't want to go down to the southeast or the Wimmera and just see, okay, you know, 12% is in park and that's good bush. Yeah. And then I'm just seeing bare paddocks, and that would be yeah. a disaster for biodiversity. Absolutely. And that, that's the world I, I'd like us to move to in mm. that all of those individual landholders, and often they're on marginal properties, so I'd like a situation where they could fence off those old remnant eucalypts, as you've yeah. mentioned, and that the if they decided to fence off around that what we see is as often three metres or something from the trunk is fenced off and they go, oh, there's my wildlife refuge. In, in one way, that's useless. In one way, it's really important. But in another way, it's useless. I'd love them to be able to fence it off and then a corridor to their boundary property and then that we find a way through the taxation system yeah. to allow them to actually make that land that they sacrifice to biodiversity profitable for them 
not just that we cover the cost of the fencing, yes, but, we, okay. but that we also make that portion of land able to earn them or at, at the very least give them an offset for the, their average earnings over maybe 15 yes. years per hectare that they have sacrificed. That, that seems to me to be able to incentivise people to do the right thing, especially in marginal farmland, which is what so much of Australia is. And it's what the Wentworth Group has been saying forever. You look at our reports and, and we're always saying we need to work out how to pay our landowners to do all the things you're talking about while producing food uh, and provide all those broader uh, landscape scale ecosystem services, even if it's just amenity, let alone biodiversity. And, and, and I feel as though the carbon market, as it's gone on, hasn't always met biodiversity needs. But as we get more sophisticated, I think the resources and money will flow because these big companies will want to be able to go and not just say they're carbon net positive. They want to say, I am biodiversity net positive because of all the things that I've done paying, by paying farmers to do these activities. And they're the best people to manage it on the ground. The worst thing would be to have government involved in those things because they basically what you wanted to to talk about is probably quite allied to what we've just talked about, and that's that the notion in conservation and environmental action of triage. So it, generally we're familiar with it as a medical term, but it's increasingly being used in uh, conservation, particularly from maybe the middle of the of the last decade. So would you like to introduce why it's a really important concept yeah and um, we all have to make choices so as we've been talking about budget constraints a lot whether we're a big company the government or bush heritage australia we have to make choices about how we allocate our effort to acquiring land and managing that land and investing in different species on that land so triage is really just shorthand for prioritization and that's where most of my lab's research and my group's research has worked for the last 30 years is to get people to return, to focus on the actions that deliver the big return on investment. We tend to call it prioritisation. People get very arced up about triage because for them they immediately see these are the things you're not doing and then they worry about all the things we're not doing. Well, you and I know that in Australia at the moment, the majority of threatened species have no recovery. The majority of threatened species have nobody working on them. So we're already uh, not doing a lot. In prioritisation processes, you work out what not to do most logically. So you try and deliver the most, save as many species as possible for the best outcome, given the resources you have. And we've generally found that that's worked well. New South Wales and now Queensland and in the past New Zealand have used those prioritisation approaches and what we find is that when you present that to governments, they actually say, oh, you've got a rational approach to allocating funds to conservation actions. We'll give you more money, which is good. That is always good. More money for conservation. We all, we all want that. I also want it to be backed with personnel and, mm. and appropriate equipment and all those kind of things as well. Do you, it, it sets up often the idea that we have to pick winners and, and losers, like yeah. that, that some species are going to win yeah. and some species are going to lose. Is that inevitable? And what's your take on that? Yeah, we already are. So we've done that. We just didn't tell anybody. So of Australia's almost 2,000 threatened species, we've picked the losers. We just don't ever admit it. Let me give you an analogy for, say, and, and the reason why we don't do it is nobody wants to talk about what they're not doing. Let's say I'm the Premier of Queensland and I am running into an election, would I go from town to town? Oh, I'm in Rockhampton. We're not opening a new hospital here because we've done a proper analysis and we've realised given the resources we have, the best place to open a new hospital is not Rockhampton, but it's Gladstone. You don't win many elections tell people what you're not doing, but it's honest. It's absolutely honest. What we do is we go to Gladstone and we say we're going to have a new hospital. And then the people in Rockhampton may be a little bit annoyed, but we don't rub it in their nose by saying we're not doing it. But to be honest, we're not. So that's what prioritisation runs the risk of and why the science of prioritisation is completely logical. Maximising the return on investment from all our activities in conservation is absolutely essential. The trouble is it creates transparency, which I love, but some parts of society struggle with transparency because transparency actually tells people not just what you are doing, but what you're not doing. 
So bottom line, we're already triaging things. We're triaging more things. But if we use a prioritisation approach, we triage less. It's a bit like the, the Ellen Show approach or the you get a pony, you get a pony, you, you get a pony, you get a pony. We, there, there's a lot of that in politics, but, mm. but the resources just aren't there for mm. us to be able to do that in conservation and certainly not they're not building hospitals in every town that needs one or in every new suburb that that needs one so they improve and and expand like the children's hospital or the women's hospital for instance and say we'll we'll give you a train track to get there what are we doing really well in in this part of policy making and resource allocation for let let's talk about birds specifically here yeah. what are we doing really well and let's focus on queensland because you're because you're there yeah. i think yeah we, queensland is about to adopt the prioritization approach more or less taking it from new south wales which is something that we set up um, several years ago the save our species approach so i think that the new south wales approach to prioritizing allocation for threatened species has been very successful They've just got another round of funding. Again, it's never as much as they would like. In Queensland, we are coming up with some more rational planning, which I hope will liberate some more funding for threatened species, particularly the things we were talking about before, the lesser-known threatened species. And you know, I always, of course, will favour birds, but to be honest, the most underfunded threatened species in Australia are generally plants. Queensland has myrtle rust. Myrtle rust is an introduced fungus rust that is potentially going to wipe out maybe 20 or 30 rainforest trees, Myrtaceae across eastern Australia, which would be arguably the biggest mass extinction of tree species Australia's ever seen by far. Yeah, I'm arguing this is a no-brainer and, and the cost of potentially saving those species. And of course, with plants, you can include volunteers, you can include community groups, you can grow them in nurseries. You can, people can do active stuff, bird stuff and mammal stuff. Can get a little bit more tricky because there's captive breeding, there's licenses, there's a whole heap of other things. But the community, I think, the, the low hanging fruit in a lot of Australia is threatened plant work done by communities. So we're heading in that direction, I hope, over the next couple of years. And also working with the natural resource management bodies who do a lot of the on ground work around habitats. So, yes, I think there's some interesting exciting opportunities that said we also know uh, through a paper written by brendan wintle who took over from me as the threatened species recovery hub research director if we really wanted to stabilize australia's species loss we need one billion dollars a year and maybe we're spending across the states and the federal government maybe 150 million dollars a year so we we have a massive shortfall we, we need to increase our threatened species funding five to tenfold to secure our species and get to a situation like the United States. Um, so the question is, can we ever convince the Australian people that this is a high priority relative to other activities? Let's go back to that in just a minute. But you mentioned the Saving Our Species program in New South mm-hmm. Wales, which mm-hmm. I was a, a huge fan of mm-hmm. when, when I found out about it. Mm-hmm. And it was being run by Matt Keane, who's now the mm-hmm treasurer of new south wales but not long after i i did an interview about saving our species they had 20 percent of their funding taken Mm. away so on in one hand it looked great that they've got this 10-year guaranteed funding then you take 20 percent of it away well putting things in perspective when we first set it up they got an extra hundred million dollars so using return on investment thinking and i spoke to the director general and i spoke to the minister work with the department we leveraged out another hundred million dollars now that has fallen back which is disappointing i agree but if you talk business to politicians and return on investment thinking they like it so can i take from that answer here that you that 20 percent cut more as being a not so much a reduction but that's almost a dividend payment to the government in a way that they that it was successful so they and and the you got extra at the front end so that they're taking a bit away at the back end? No, I, I don't like the 20% cut. I think they should have had a 20% increase because we're still way short. We're still way short of what New South Wales leads, let alone the rest of the nation. So, no, I would just say that a whole heap of government departments were told to cut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 of course, Matt Keane's the treasurer now, so the, the, this is where his commitment to the environment can be 
can be tested because it's within his want to yeah. make some changes. But I, I don't want to focus on him because because if, if if we can have him as a champion, that's yeah. much better than having him as somebody that we're always bashing. But yeah, I'm yeah that that was something that was really disappointing personally to me. But Hugh, a billion dollars a year. Do you think we are perhaps in maybe a couple of election cycles ever likely to see that kind of money allocated to environmental causes or to conservation generally? I don't know, to be honest. I'm always optimistic that we should, as a scientist, I'm, and our hub was always there just to say this is what you need. If you really want to stop, slow extinctions down to an acceptable level, these are the resources that you need. And to my mind, many politicians will say to you, in the end, you, if most of the Australian people want it, we'll do it. So I'd say that the fight is still in everybody's street, in everybody's neighbourhood, as getting them out, enjoying nature, loving natural history, understanding that we are in a, an extinction crisis. And once that movement grows and it grows big enough, it will go through to the ballot box and it will go through the funding. So it's a long haul. It's a long haul. So in some senses... We should lobby politicians, we should talk to politicians, we make our voice heard, but we also have to talk to one another. Now, as we said when we were setting up our discussion, you're also at University of Queensland. So you've been in, in academia for a long time, worked overseas, as, as you've mentioned. You were at, uh, in the UK as well as in America. What's your feeling about how our educational institutions adapting and delivering programs, developing labs like your own that are integral to conservation. How, how do you feel we're going in Australia generally? Yeah, universities across the board have had a tough time in the last couple of years since COVID, so they all have major funding shortfalls. So ignoring that, the, I see two or three things happening. Uh, one is that there's no doubt about it, Australia is the world-leading conservation science country in the planet, and that you can see that through various metrics. For example, let's say climate change or broader environmental science. Australia has 32 of the top 300 climate scientists in the world, 11%. We don't have 11% of the top medical scientists. We don't have 11% of the top astronomers. This is something where we're truly world-class in conservation science, we probably have 20% of the top scientists in the entire world. So we are the envy of the rest of the world in terms of the quality and the quantity of science we do in conservation and ecology. We're also, I think, in many cases, unashamedly applied. When I first started doing applied work 40, 30 years ago, many of my colleagues in biology departments would be poo-pooing stuff. They would be saying if you're a good scientist you're a pure scientist and you study uh, why there's three hairs on the left hand side of a drosophila's back leg and i said no actually i think science for me is a mission outcome driven process and now however that's not question it's not embarrassing to be an applied ecologist or a conservation scientist in a university conservation science has gone in leaps and bounds forward and the students are voting with their feet. They all want to do conservation courses. They're the most popular courses. The number of people who want to do a PhD in conservation and have real impact is growing enormously. And people are coming from overseas in vast quantities. So I, in the last 30 years, have supervised, as a primary supervisor, almost 90 PhD students, 60 postdocs, 70 honours students. So this is 200 people and half of them are from overseas who want to come to us to, to do have an impact through their research. I wasn't aware of, of how significant those numbers were, Hugh, but you've made me feel an awful lot better about my applied science qualification because I, I got it at the time where it was poo-pooed and laughed mm. at, particularly in the area I got it in as well, but that's a whole different question. Hugh, can, before we tackle the extremely difficult bird emergency standard questions, can I perhaps ask you to talk about what you think in your time in policy development have been the greatest successes or the most significant developments that have been for me, two successes all around the mid 2000s. It was one we wrote the Brigelow Declaration. Wrote that declaration it was based on a letter that I wrote to Peter Beattie and John Howard about the urgent need to stop land clearing because land clearing was 
wiping out biodiversity, causing soil loss, potentially causing salinity, enormous greenhouse gas emissions. So we wrote that in 2004, and uh, within a year, Peter Beatty waived the letter I wrote, called the Brigalow Direct Declaration that 470 scientists had signed and said, we're going to stop land clearing. And he did an enormous amount. He and Anna Bly, for a period of time, brought land clearing down from over 500,000 hectares a year to 50 thousand hectares a year which is equivalent in a climate change perspective is taking half all the cars in australia off the road half all the cars off the road and of course in terms of saving habitat maybe two or three million hectares of habitat were saved it's a small european country so sometimes science does speak to politics and sometimes it arrives at the right time and there's politicians who want to make a difference with the science and at that point in time it is interesting that in later conversations i discovered that they generally didn't know how bad land clearing was for the economy of the nation and for biodiversity and for soil and water. We continue to fight that fight, and I'll make no bones about the fact that Campbell Newman reversed all those laws and since kind of a little bit backwards and we'll fight that fight again. So that's one where, you know, science changed had a major impact on biodiversity and climate change in Australia. The second one was getting the rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef to happen, and that was a very science-based process led by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Parks Authority, but also they used our software, our spatial planning software, to build the first and largest systematic design protected area system in the world that protected at least 20% of every ecosystem type and anything else we could map. And that model of building a representative protected area system that was implemented in the Great Barrier Reef is now being used all over the world by organisations from Belize to Seychelles to South Africa, even to the United Kingdom. Australia's ability to build well-designed protected area systems that are connected and representative, and which hasn't always gone so well in some states and, and federally, that approach in the Great Barrier Reef has been a global first-class example. Of course, the Great Barrier Reef has many other problems, but um, the design of the reserve system has assisted a lot. And as a, a clear example of science changing policy on the ground, and then going global. That's that's a pretty huge and significant body of work that you've got behind you, Hugh. But I wonder if in the future you'll be as well known as the guy who started because you are, of course, the co-originator of Bird a Minute. Bird a Minute, that could be what I hope to be famous for. Yes, I don't really care whether anybody remembers me from tomorrow or certainly after my death. I'm more happy that something that we did has, has had such global impact and delivered outcomes on the ground. But yeah, Bird a Minute, that's my retirement plan, which I don't know if you want to explain Bird a Minute or shall I explain Bird a Minute? We've talked to Jeremy about it and he credits you and a couple of good bottles of red wine, I think, for the inspiration. But hey, it's, it's your baby. So why don't you tell everyone what Bird a Minute is and why it's so much fun. It, yeah, it came up because when I was at Adelaide University, it was 25 years, I was trying to convince my maths, I was there in the maths department to do more bird watching. Mathematicians love quantifying things, so we started recording how many birds we would see in different periods of time. And then I said, well, let's turn this into a competition. And I ha- happen to be uh, unavoidably, anybody who knows me, obsessively competitive, overly competitive. I'll, I'll play chess with a three-year-old and try and beat them as ruthlessly as possible. And not a pleasant sight. But how do you make bird watching competitive? Let's see how many, how long you can go where you're seeing at least one species of bird per minute. So, in fact, my last effort was at Oxley Creek Common, where I think I got to 54. So you get to a nice spot, you're overlooking a wetland, you'll see maybe six or seven birds in the first minute, and then three or four. Of course, things start drying up because you're running out of birds. And then I think, as Jeremy would have said, it's an interesting problem where the more you travel, and we can only do it on foot, so you've got to run around, but the more you run, the less you hear and see two different places and habitats until... The point at which uh, at 55 minutes, I'd only seen 54 birds. So my score was 54 birds. Yeah, it's amazing how difficult it is to get a big number. It's really dependent. I I really only regularly bird my local patch Mm. and and it's pretty hard to get over 20 here without without having to stop. (laughs) But why I think bird is great, I gravitated to it, is it gives people the opportunity to perhaps plan a twitching adventure 
and that a family, instead of, oh, dad's off looking at birds again, it's like playing spy on the way there in the car that you can bring in the non-obsessive birder members of the family or the friendship group and get them involved. It's a fun Uh, little game. And actually, I would say I tend to bird by ear almost entirely. So many of my 54 species, probably 20 of them I never saw. The advantage of having a second person, it doesn't matter who they are, whether they know much about it or whether they're five years old, is I am entering into eBird when I'm seeing and I'm listening and I'm focusing and I'm often not looking up. And I miss um, flyovers, particularly birds. So there's benefit to the extra set of eyes wherever you are because you can never look at You can hear your whole surroundings. You can't see your whole surroundings. It's good that we've got to got to bird watching eventually, Hugh. So let Let's tackle the bird emergency questions. When you're out in a new patch, what's your field guide of choice? Let's talk about, and then when you've been overseas, what did you use? I don't use field guides at all, really, anymore. I I don't carry anything when I bird watch, so I don't even carry water. I just bird watch binoculars and my uh, smartphone. If anything, I'll then... The only thing that I won't know is occasionally I'll hear a call and I won't be completely sure and then I would have I would have called up either Stuart or Morecambe to just check a call. That maybe only happens once every two or three bird watching trips. And overseas of course the field guides are essential. I have a collection of field guides and I have field guides to places I've never been to, I'm embarrassed to say, because I just love them. So I love field guides and I have a field guide to the birds of Venezuela and I just sometimes like to look at it. My modus operandi going to new countries and I have managed to travel to lots of countries in my life, which has been great, is to use the plane trip to just to look at pictures, picture after picture and I memorise as much as possible. So when I get there, I don't have to look at myself. I'm just basically trying to memorise as many birds as possible. Now, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a bird nerd. There is no doubt about yeah. that. If you just stray a little bit, how, how did you go from studying mathematics, because yeah. that was your first degree, I think, I'm right. How did you go from being a mathematician to being a field guide reader every time you're on a plane when did birds jump into it birds came in early so i my father was bird watcher so i was bird watching by the time i was 10 Uh, for the first year or two i found it a bit annoying because my father would be out in the desert and and i was eight or nine and it's hot and then he wanted to bird watch so he'd leave me under a bush and say (laughs) i had a pack of plastic three soldiers so I'd sit under the acacia and I'd, my two soldiers would fight the ants and two hours later my brother would come. And he found me every time. So that worked well. But after a while, the allure of fighting ants with soldiers, you, you never win. The ants always win. Wore off and I started bird watching. So I've been bird watching for a long time. Uh, and my father, who was an engineer, really started getting me interested in, without having a background in science or ecology, because he was an engineer just counting stuff. He was interested in numbers and patterns and seasonal changes so we were a little bit obsessive about quantification and that means that I went into maths knowing that some of the maths I was going to learn was going to be useful in my career as an ecologist and it it gives you an enormous advantage having a lot of quantitative skills in the field of ecology. Ecology has become more and more mathematical every decade that's passed and and in some sense it's, it's a fortuitous bonus having those quantitative skills because I can bring them to conservation problems and most of the people in conservation are not always great at computer programming, statistics and, and modelling. Did you, you actually went into your mathematics degree with, already with an eye on a, a further career as an ecologist? Did to, I a certain, that right? to a certain extent, I, I, wanted, I was trying to do a mixture of zoology and maths. The zoology department where I was at Adelaide University didn't impress me very much and I had fights with them, so I ended up doing <laughs> Biochemistry, that was a useful set of skills as well, but it meant you had to sit in a lab. But in maths, it's all a bit more computers were much more pleasant than sitting in labs watching centrifuges go round and round in circles. <laughs> so I, I, it was partly intent, but certainly in the end, by the time I finished my undergraduate degree, I could see a pathway. And this is very early, and the overlap of maths and ecology was still in its early phases. One of the great mentors and leaders in this field is Robert May, who died just a year ago. He was 
probably Australia's most famous um, scientist, and he was one of the great founders of mathematical ecology, ended up being the president of the Royal Society in, in England, ended up being the chief science advisor to the British government for several years, and I suppose was one of these people that transformed the way ecology and conservation worked because he brought all these quantitative tools to bear, and, and that was 20 years ahead of my That was a, a, a nice diversion. There's so much to uh, talk to you about in terms of where your career has gone, but you mentioned that you, when you're out bird watching, you might pull up one of the apps. So does that mean when you're out, you've always got the phone with you so that you can... I'm always collecting data. So in fact, sometimes I'm collecting both. Uh, I'll do 20-minute, two-hectare counts for bird data, and then I'll be doing an e-bird list for the whole site. And then, yes, so I've always got my iPhone. So that that's the clear answer about what's your essential piece of kit when you're out when you're out and about because you're birding with your ears. Uh, what's your bucket list location for to be able to go birding here? Have you got somewhere that you oh, wish yeah. you could go? I, mean, I really do just love birding in my local patches, and, I, and I'm going back now to the southeast of South Australia, redoing bird transects my father and I did in 1981. So my passion is actually taking that area and trying to understand what's happened in the last 40 years. I did vegetation maps, we did transects. So that's probably my obsession. But at the back of my mind, I do seeing new birds. My Australian bird list is not is not great because I'm not a twitcher in the sense if somebody says an Indian, some bird from India or Siberia has turned up in the middle of New South Wales, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I don't seek out rarities or no. what is it, South Island pied oyster catcher turns up at port here, I won't bother. I like to see birds where they really live. So w- where are my big gaps? Definitely uh, Cape York and the Iron Range, and I've got 22 birds that I need to see there. The grass wrens, I've got five of the 13 of them. In the, I draw when I look at those grass wren trips and think about seeing half a dozen more grass wren species. So I really do love bush birds, to be honest, and mm. the big gaps in my Australian list are pelagics. My enthusiasm for sitting on boats in the middle of the ocean vomiting is quite my... I like all birds, but I, I, I really yeah. love bush birds. I love, I love the interaction between birds and their habitat. I love habitat specialists, so we, I just love seeing a mangrove jerigony. Nothing makes me happy. Or an eastern bristle bird in dense heathland. Heathland birds also fascinate me because they're such specialised habitat dwellers. Well, I think we've skipped over most of them just in, in the conversation, but... Have you got a bucket list bird here? Not particularly, no. My favourite birds are black chin honey ears, which I don't know why, I just I find them an interesting declining woodland bird. But no, there's nothing particular that I, I, I do. If I'm going to add to my list, I really want to focus on Australian bush breeding birds. There's probably at least another 80 or 90 of them I still haven't found, and some are in difficult places. So the, the black chin honey eater is... That's your favourite Australian bird? Yeah. I don't think it's anybody else's favourite Australian bird. We, they're almost extinct in South Australia. They're really struggling. Maybe 100 in the Adelaide Hills. There might be 100 down in the southeast. Where we had a house at Victor Harbour when I was growing up, we had a, quite a good group there, and I just love their call. And they, I love to see that blue mark above the eye is quite a special thing. It's tiny and small, um, but to me it's really beautiful. I was l- lamenting, I think, the other day when I spoke with Rowan Clark about the obvious decline in the areas that, that I've, I go to mm. with the white-naped honey eater, which, of course, oh. is a close relative to the black chin. Let's just speculate. Do you think that entire group is... To- There's a bit on the bottom of the pecking order. We, in, I'm sure you've had some noisy minor discussions on this program several times. Australian honey eaters are so aggressive and it's unusual because you don't see so much aggression in any other communities of birds anywhere else in the world and it doesn't always noisy miners it can be prior birds but the the mellow threats are, are really at the bottom of the pecking order in general aren't they and so as we change and modify habitats I think they have suffered disproportionately they're always being chased by something and it can even be a white plumed honey eater that's chasing them or a yellow plumed honey eaters are just more territorial and aggressive I suppose those little merely threptus honey eaters, they tend to be a little bit more nomadic, so they're not used to defending their resource. Yeah, and overlooked because of because of the way they the way they hang out. They're they're not like the yellow winged honey eater or the yeah. white plumed that are in your face. If if they're around, yeah. you, you see them. Here we've almost got to the end, but 
Here's the hardest question for oh. you. The and it's a doozy. So, are you ready? Yes. What is the best bird? What is the best bird? So, I'm 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 going to stick with black tin honeyeaters for the reasons I already meant. I do have a bit of a fondness for individual birds that are in their own family. So, well, maybe to your point, would I like to see most? That probably means plains wanderer has to be on the top. I've not seen a plains wanderer, so I'd love to see it, something that superficially looks like a quail but isn't a quail. So I've probably enjoyed seeing birds like that, secretary birds. You know, I'd love to see that thing in Africa. Is it a shoebill? Yeah, the, the shoebill, the shoebill that's stalk, that, that, that often comes up as a favourite. Yeah, any of those, is it 37 or so birds that are just in their own family? I just think it's special. Seeing all the birds in the world is clearly impossible. My total bird list is still well below 4,000 globally. But I wouldn't mind seeing every family of bird at least once. That's a doable task. People get that done. Do, do, you know, do you know off the top of your head, can you tell me your Australian number or do you have Absolutely. to go and look it up? No, I don't know. Of, of just birds in general or families? Well, it, either. Just ber- birds in general. A compulsive twitcher will be able to oh, rattle right. off a number. Not yeah, I'm not. I think I'm. I think my Australian bird list is at five sixty seven, which is yeah, missing well, names, magics, and northern Australian things. That that's pretty hefty. That's pretty hefty. And your worldwide list, you you've broken four thousand. No, I haven't. I haven't broken no. four thousand. I think it's around three thousand two hundred, three thousand three hundred. It's a bit tricky because I have old lists in old bird books that I haven't entered into eBird, and of course it's hard to match them all up because you know, let's say great egret. There was once one great egret, <laughs> an eastern great egret and western great egret, and then so you can't just take your European bird book and say four hundred and fifty and add it to yeah, your North yeah, American yeah. bird book because of all the taxonomy changes. So I'll, that my retirement task will be to get on top of my um, list. But yeah, if I was a proper twitcher, I would know the answer to this question. <laughs> yes, the, the geneticists will never let us settle on a number of how many yeah. birds there are, and that's one of the great delights of being involved in birding is that you never actually know the absolute answer to anything, I don't think. Uh, and, and it's just exciting sometimes to see how much we still have to learn. We would have thought we'd sorted all these bird things out, new insights, and, of course, new insights into their breeding biology, their behaviour. So bird ecology is going to be a fascinating topic in Australia for decades. Yep. Just one last thing here before we... Get- we call it quits for this episode is how hopeful are you that the well-known critically endangered bird species Mm. in Australia how confident are you that we'll be able to retain most of them or or are we inevitably going to lose a lot of the birds that we're focusing on at the moment in the next 20 years yeah yeah I'm a bit worried I'm worried about I'm trying to think of just giving advice to Queensland recently about what have we lost in Queensland recently. It looks as though the southern starfinch, including a subspecies, nobody seen since 1995. That's probably gone. It's not less as extinct yet, but it's hard to imagine us finding it. Then there's things that, like buff-breasted button quail, which we're struggling to find again. And even if we do find it, the numbers will be small. And the management for a species like that is going to be quite challenging, isn't it? It's in relatively remote areas. Um, yeah, I, I think there's an urgent need to for active intervention on a number of these bird species and something like, well, let's say we do find it and we find enough of it. What are we going to do about it? Is it grazing management? We're talking about 20 years of hard work, much like the hard work that was done on golden shoulder parrots and things like that. And even that, they're not out of the woods. I would hope that we're not going to see any more bird extinctions in my lifetime, but I wouldn't want it out. Hugh, hopefully, hopefully that comes to pass that that we hang on to all of them. Appreciate you taking the the time, and I really want to congratulate you and your your team because all of those examples that you talked about have actually had a pretty good amount of coverage in the mainstream press. So that mm-hmm. means that your team and yourself are effectively getting the the message out. So. That's great. If only, if only we could get that amount of coverage for yeah. everybody's work and everybody's projects, and that it was dinner concert.
conversation for all the households around the country instead of, oh, no, what's Kanye West said this week? It's Kanye West. <laughs> yeah, it's, don't you wish that was the way it was? Everyone would go, who? What? Yeah, yeah. So thank, thanks so much for joining it's me. It's been, it's been uh, very educational for me and I'm sure anyone who watches. And there's so many issues that we've, we've come up. Perhaps we might be able to talk about some of them in greater detail with some other people in a, in a Monday <laughs> megaphone sometimes down the track. Oh, yes. They're always good to have somebody to argue with us. Yeah, no, it's uh, been a thank you. That's right. Actually, one, one thing that's just come to mind, there's another University of Queensland person who's very prominent on bird Twitter, and that's Dr Nick. Mm. Is he one of, your, one of your brethren there? Dr Nick and I have, have the odd chat that, yeah, he likes the photographs and the night birds and stuff like that. Yeah, just he's fun. And I think one of these people is also getting the word out there, which, and, and obviously he's a brilliant photographer. And I couldn't take a bird picture if it fell on top of me. I mean, I'm so bad, it's embarrassing. I, I actually I post the worst bird pictures in the entire world. <laughs> There's a shout out to Dr. Nick, who's at the St. Lucia campus of University of Queensland as well. If you want to follow Hugh and his terrible bird photos, it's Hugh Possum, possum. Which, Huge Possum, beg your pardon, Huge Possum on Twitter and you'll see some very interesting factoids and some awful photos of birds. <laughs> Hugh, thanks so much for joining me. I'm thanks Grant so. Williams. This has been The Bird Emergency. That's uh, the Chief Scientist in, in Queensland, Hugh Possingham. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>